Escalier. I am the Eau de France representative to the United Kingdom and director for UK and Ireland at uh, North France Invest. So the objective for today's webinar is twofold, really. It's first of all to understand all the new constraints that have arisen since the 1st of January to EU-UK trade and to help you uh, understand the solutions that you can put forward in order to preserve your access to EU clients. So as you all know, the UK-EU deal that has been struck on the eve of Christmas last year came into force on the 1st of January. So the good thing is that it provides for tariff-free and quota-free trade. Uh, the bad news is that, as most of you will have noticed, it's far from being hassle-free or from providing uh, frictionless trading, as used to be the case uh, until 31st of December uh, last year. And that's in particular because of a number of new constraints, whether they relate to customs regulations, to rules of origin, or to uh, the CE marking for products, for example. So the two key messages we want you to take, uh, take away from this webinar is really that on the one hand, uh, these restrictions are here to stay. Uh, it would be a bit too optimistic to expect uh, any exemptions for companies specifically or for sectors as a whole uh, in order to return to how things were before the 1st of January, uh, and especially given the uh, low level of goodwill between the UK and the EU in the current context. And the second message really is that these obstacles are not unsurmountable. Uh, it's really all a matter of organization, and that's really why we're here for. Um, so in order to help you navigate these, difficult, these difficulties, we have a number of experts with us uh, today. Uh, we have Aline Doucin, who is a partner at Hogan Lobels, a law firm. Uh, we have Jean-Michel Tillier, who's the Interregional Director for Customs at uh, Eau de France. And we have Olivier Toir, who is Customs and Fiscal Representation Director at uh, GEFCO. So now, without further, to, without further ado, on to you, Aline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Artis, and, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining the webinar today. Can I just check that the sound is OK from your end? Yeah. OK, so uh, just a few minutes to take stock on, on the TCA, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, what the provisions mean for you in practice and how you can anticipate and navigate the, the challenges that this, this new additional formalities uh, mean for, for you cross-border trade, uh, EU27 and, and, and GB. Perhaps if, if we can move to the first slide of my presentation, please. Thank you. So, so, so thank you, Artis, for the introduction. Let us now have a closer look at the content of, of the TCA, because as, as I'm sure you will all know on the call, it covers a broad amount of topics, ranging from trading goods and services to investment, competition and state aid, as well as energy and sustainability, and, and of course, let's not forget fisheries. Uh, so starting from the provision of on trade in goods in the agreement, um, uh, the agreement goes beyond the traditional FTA, the free trade agreements that, that the EU and the UK have concluded with, with other trading partners and provides for zero tariffs and zero quotas on, on all goods. And this is important because it is indeed in that specific respect, um, a very ambitious free trade agreement that, that the UK that the UK and the EU have, have concluded uh, in December. But what does it mean for you in practice? Well, it means a couple of things. The first one, and very importantly, of course, uh, is that goods originating in the EU and the UK respectively can be exported across the channel duty free. Goods that fail to satisfy the relevant origin rules will not be granted preferential tariff treatment, so 0% um, tariff, and will be subject to the normal WTO import tariffs. And those tariffs uh, are set um, uh, in the EU by the EU Common Customs Tariff. I'm sure on the call you will be familiar with TARIC, the database that the EU Commission has um, um, implements and, and monitors and that gives you for each specific line of your product the applicable tariffs under EU law and on the UK side uh, uh, the, the, the global UK tariff. And it's worth noting that outside of the applicability of this TCA, of this agreement, the UK global tariff maintains 34% 
of the tariff lines at the same level as what it used to apply as a member of the EU under the EU common customs tariff and fully liberal, liberalize 17% of tariff lines from an average of 3.6% in the EU to 0% in the UK. So there is outside of the applicability of the 0% uh, tariff under the TCA, if your goods do not meet the requirement for that specific preferential trade, preferential tariff, and um, uh, one would have to look at the default option, which are the UK global tariff and the EU common customs tariff, which are have some different um, uh, uh, tariff structure on specific lines. Note, and it's very important to note because we have seen many clients sort of some, sometimes um, uh, grasping with that issue. Note that if goods are not subject to tariffs in the EU or in the UK, i.e. in other terms, if your goods are already uh, under a 0% tariff, uh, in uh, the EU customs tariff, under the EU customs tariff for the UK global tariff. Well, there is, of course, no need to claim the EU UK preferential origin. You would just put an additional burden, uh, uh, an additional paperwork, an additional process to a specific trade that is already at 0% tariff. So there is no need for, for you to, to do that. Perhaps if we can move to the next slide with, uh, please, sorry. <laughs> So on a specific focus on, on rules of origin, uh, because I indicated earlier that only goods, and I quote, originating in the EU or the UK can be traded between both parties at 0% duty. So what does it mean exactly to have a good originating in either the UK or the EU? Well, the TCA provides specific rules uh, to determine the origin of a product when it incorporates non-EU or non-UK components. So if you have some specific, if you import some specific material, for instance, from China, and you import it in the EU and you want to um, uh, trade with you and export it to a UK customers, you will have to consider whether your product meet the, the, the preferential origin rule under the EU-UK uh, agreements. Those rules are very product specific. They are set out in detail in an annex to the agreement uh, and provide for the specific conditions that each product category, according to its customs classification, must fulfill in order to be considered as originating. It can be pretty complex in terms of navigating through the different uh, uh, product specific rules. And in a sense, um, uh, the rules revolve around the questions of where a certain proportion of a product's components are made and where does the assembly take place. So just to give you an example, if you have a car manufactured in Germany, with non-EU materials, uh, it would be deemed of EU origin under the applicable um, uh, origin rules under the TCA if the maximum value of non-EU originating materials does not exceed 45% or 50% of the x works value of the car. Uh, so those, this is just an example for the automotive sector, but you have very uh, specific rules depending on, on the actual product at, at stake. Those rules are pretty standard. Uh, uh, rules of origin in, in EU free trade agreements, so nothing really new under the sun here. But of course, for companies and clients that have always dealt with intra-EU trade, um, uh, uh, they are now sort of grasping with this additional requirement of complying with EU rules of origin that, of course, did not apply as a member of when the UK was a member of, of the EU uh, customs union and the EU single market. One point to note on the rules of origin is that the agreement provides for bilateral accumulation between the EU and the UK. This means that materials originating in one party can be used in the production of a product in the other party and still be considered originate, originating so long as it is subject to substantial working or processing in the other party. So taking my car example, for instance, this would mean that a car produced in Germany 
New Zealand's originating in the UK that represents 70% of its ex wax value would still be considered of EU origin because the UK originating components would count as EU origin. Importantly, however, the TCA does not provide, does not allow for diagon diagonal accumulation, which was an ask of the UK government, but which the EU um, did not grant. Which this means that materials from third countries, which either party has, um, with which either party has other FTA, does not count in our in our own accumulation um, uh, calculation. Um, this is on rules of origin, and perhaps I, I can go to the next slide, please, on, on customs formalities. So what about custom formalities? Because we talk about tariffs, we talk about rules of origin, but what about sort of the customs process that are applicable under the, the TCA? Well, many companies and, and many of our clients were hoping that an EU-UK agreement would mean completely frictionless trade, free of any customs checks, like it used to be until end of December 2020. And unfortunately, as Artus pointed out, the agreement does not allow for such uh, frictionless trade. Um, although originating products are traded without uh, tariffs and import duties, um, uh, customs formalities and procedure apply and this was inevitable uh, as the UK decided to uh, withdraw from the customs union and the single market. So in practice this means that companies have to clear customs at the EU27 border and GB border. So if, if, you, if you are a French company looking to export your product to the UK or the other way around, this means that before exporting your product you will have to think of you know, um, submitting and completing your, your customs declaration, look at the potential uh, rules of origin compliance requirement if you have non-EU or non-UK components, appoint a customs agent and look at the which type of, of mode of representation you would want to to uh, um, uh, establish with your with your customs representative think of submitting an export declaration that will allow you uh, not to be submitted to uh, um, supply VAT in in your country then uh, export the product uh, at at point of entering into the GB you would think of import declaration potential payment of import VAT etc uh, etc et Right. With bearing in mind that you need indeed the EORI number at both end of the process, both in the EU and in GB, and, and very important to assess in your contractual uh, arrangements with your customers or your counterparts in, in, in the UK or in, in the EU, who is the importer of records, who is the exporter of record, etc. Perhaps we can move to the next slide, please, Artus, and I will stop there. If, if we can wrap um, up so, that slide so that we can... Yes, I'm, I'm done. Ahead, Thank yeah. you, Artus. So in, in one minute, just remember that it's worth uh, bearing in mind that customs also check not only the import duties that are applicable to your chair, but also the product-specific requirements that apply to the placement of your product on the market. So that's, that is if you have to comply with CE marking or UK marking uh, in, in GB or in the EU. And, and I will stop here. It is also worth remembering, and we've seen a lot of questions and misconception of importer of records uh, and um, uh, the entity responsible for placing the product on, on the market, those entities are not necessarily the same entity. It's not because you are the declarant of your goods before customs that you are also the one that needs to appear on the label of your product. And I will stop here and happy to take any questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Aline. Now on to you, Jean-Michel. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Artus. Uh, the slide, please. The slides should be on their way here. Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. On, the f on, the, on this first uh, slide, uh, some, some advice is 
uh, just mm, with, which have been made also by uh, Aline uh, just uh, bef before me. But I, I want to stress the importance of uh, respecting this, this advice. The, the, the first thing is something that uh, many people have forgotten uh, or, or misunderstand uh, f uh, in, the, the, in their reading of the withdrawal uh, agreement and the cooperation agreement of the, uh, last December. The first is the need to carry out uh, customs and health uh, formalities. It's uh, very important. What does it mean? It means that an export declaration must be made uh, in UK. You must also uh, you must also make uh, um, um, an exit declaration in ICS, uh, Import Control System. Uh, which is the uh, EU EU system for uh, for, for uh, bef before uh, crossing the the, the, the border? Uh, then you have to make an import declaration in, in France or in, in other uh, member states of, of EU. And what we uh, strongly recommend is to make uh, the transit declaration to cross the short straits as quickly as possible. Uh, we think that it is the, the 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 best the best way of uh, of crossing uh, the the short straits. Uh, this also means that you need uh, to anticipate these formalities before the track uh, leaves your, your premises. And for all these formalities, it's strongly recommended to use a registered custom representative like, uh, like Olivier, which is with us. Uh, for origin questions, uh, just to also to stress what Aline just said, uh, the first thing to do is to check if whether your product is a tax or, or not. Uh, if it's in most cases, uh, if it is not necessary to apply for a preferential origin and therefore to prove it, which can be uh, difficult in, in, in some cases. So check uh, this, this, uh, this thing first uh, before uh, applying for preferential origin. And maybe I, I can add a third, a, a third uh, advice is to, uh, to have an inco term uh, defined as, uh, as, as clearly as possible uh, in order to, to, uh, to have clear responsibilities uh, before you and your, and your seller or, or your buyer. It's important in order to, to know what is, uh, who is responsible for the, the various formalities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in this slide and and uh, and the followings, uh, uh, an extract of possible tools uh, that are permitted by the EU, legisla EU legislation. It's not uh, the total uh, possibilities; it's just a choice. And the first is that you you can you, you can benefit of a national centralized custom clearance authorization, uh, which allow to have only a single uh, uh, interface with the customs the custom administration and uh, you you can for example you can have all your uh, customs clearance in uh, in Dunkerque uh, and uh, in Dunkerque they can uh, they can manage your all your custom declaration in every part uh, in every custom office of the uh, of France and maybe in uh, of, of Europe uh, what we call uh, the, the uh, customs uh, dédouanement centralisé communautaire uh, communitary centralized uh, cast, uh, clearance. So the first, I think, the first, uh, the, the, the first tool. And to apply for it, you can contact the business consulting unit uh, in every uh, regional uh, customs and uh, excise economic action center, which is called in France uh, Pôle d'Action Économique. Uh, and we, you will have the, 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 the addresses and the, the contact number uh, just at, at the end of my uh, introduction. Uh, the, second, the second one, if uh, the second tool is that you, you can postpone uh, the, the payment uh, of uh, your uh, VAT and maybe in some in some cases of your of your duty uh, but you need uh, for that you need to uh, to use uh, the the services of uh, uh, RDE uh, représentant en douane enregistré uh, registered custom representative uh, or you you need to have a fiscal a fiscal presence or representation uh, in uh, in EU and to apply uh to apply for this uh, postponed accounting mechanism, you need to contact the regional custom collector, which is near uh, the uh, Pôle d'Action Economique uh, I just mentioned before. 
And you have finally uh, the, the, the possibility to defer payment of custom duties uh, of and taxes for, for uh, so, uh, one month, and to apply it, uh, to apply for it, uh, it's the same uh, the same address, the regional custom collector. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, in the box, uh, in the toolbox, in the community toolbox, uh, I think uh, very useful uh, procedures, as what which are called special pro uh, procedures. Uh, for three different types of business operation, if you want to, to process goods, if you want to storage, to store, or if you want to use uh, goods, uh, they are designated to give your business a uh, competitive edge <coughs> over rival international firms. You can, for example, uh, import non-union products under duty suspension, custom duties, national taxes, VAT, and also trade policy measures, uh, uh, EU trade policy measures, are, are, which are suspended, or import uh, products at lower custom duty rates or zero custom duty. The second, uh, second example, you can store, use, or process this good tax-free depending on your business needs. And finally, you can export union goods for processing, then re-import finished uh, uh, products partly exempt from duties and taxes. It's uh, it this third uh, possibilities that you can uh, use if you want to have uh, goods repaired, for example, goods from EU repaired in uh, uh, in UK and then return in uh, e EU. And to apply for these procedures, uh, you can contact your custom office uh, or the business uh, consulting unit uh, of your regional customs and excise economic action center, uh, which is called, uh, I remember, the Pôle d'Action Economique. And finally, uh, transit procedure. You, you remember that uh, uh, it's a strong advice from us to use uh, transit to, 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 to cross uh <coughs> to cross uh, the, the channel between U UK, uh, UK and France, but you can add to this transit, transit push, uh, procedure uh, two authorization uh, in order to, to have your transit coming directly to your premises, it's, which is called uh, uh, destinataire agréé et uh, expéditeur consign uh, authorized consigner and destinatory. And uh, fin uh, finally, uh, the final tool I want to, uh, to focus is uh, that you can secure your customs clearance uh, even if you take the, uh, the services of, uh, uh, uh <coughs> of a, a registered customer representative. Uh, by uh, means of binding tariff information, uh, it's very important to have a precise uh, uh, classification of your of your goods in order to know if they if you can benefit or not uh, of a special ta special special tariff at the at, at importation. You can have uh, binding information on origin, uh, which is, I think, the most important thing now because the, 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 the agreement is very young and we don't know exactly how to use it and to combine it with other, uh, other agreement. And, uh, and finally, you can have also provisional value authorization, adjustment authorization, which are very useful uh, when you have uh, relations between uh, your, 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 your business and um, maybe subsidiaries in France or the, or the, the, the country. Uh, you can make this request uh, online, online uh, so very, very easily. And finally, some addresses. Uh, I, I speak of about uh, Pôle d'Action Économique. Uh, you have then uh, the free uh, Pôle d'Action Économique, uh, which are uh, at your disposal in uh, Hauts de France, uh, in Amiens, in Dunkerque, and uh, in uh, Lille. And they can give you uh, dedicated and more uh, personal personalized information, in, uh, taking in into account uh, your specific needs. Thank, Thank you very much, Jean-Michel. And just to note that so all these uh, contact details will be available in the, in the replay that we will send around. Now, on to you, Olivier. Thank you, Artus. Thank you for giving me the floor today. So if we can get the slides. Yeah. Seems to work. <laughs> so, uh, yes, can you please move to the next one? So I will try to go um, quite quickly about the, the new border because um, I guess most of you knows it and uh, we don't have time to go. Yeah, if you can go to the next one. 
we don't have time to go too deeply, but I will very quickly wrap up the, the issues. So from EU to GBE, uh, we have a new border, as uh, it has been said just before. And um, first, we need an export declaration, very basic, but we also need a preload UK declaration, meaning uh, you need, uh, you know that the, the steps have, has been, have been postponed, some of them, um, but at the end, anyway, you will need to use GVMS, or you are using also Destinate for the northern countries, uh, northern ports, uh, or systems like that. Um, the important point is you need this preload UK declaration when you cross from EU to UK. So you need a, a broker, a custom broker in the UK to perform this uh, custom declaration, you have different kinds of uh, authorizations, simplified authorizations. Uh, the easiest one I would say is the EIDR, meaning you are postponing your custom declaration for six months, uh, up to six months. It's also a dangerous one. Huh? Uh, as custom workers, we are not fully uh, happy with this one. <laughs> we think it's, uh, it's dangerous for companies. Uh, but you also can cross with a transit, with a tier, tier attack carnet. And um, as I said, GVMS, uh, when we speak about French border, is mandatory today for transit. Uh, but soon, I mean, it has been postponed, but it will also be mandatory for other uh, declarations. You can move to the next one. On the other side, from uh, GB to EU, um, so you can, or you need, some, you need something. You need a transit when you want to move, as uh, Jean-Michel said, to an agreed uh, destination. Uh, but also what on French side uh, we did, uh, French customs uh, decided to have some innovation, uh, meaning to be able to prelodge your import declaration, for example, or to prelodge a French transit, uh, to make sure the track won't stop at the border, except for sure, in case of SPS uh, goods, because you will, you may have a control, uh, but you also may have uh, some controls uh, for um, other goods, uh, even if, um, to be honest, we don't have uh, uh, so many today. Huh? Um, so, if we can move to the next one. Um, I will now speak about trade, uh, trade in France, how to trade in France. I, I know it's a, it's a question, um, a regular question. Uh, so British companies are foreign companies uh, now out of the EU. So if as British company you want to trade in the EU and I will focus on France today, um, you have two options. You can set up a subsidiary or a branch. I know some companies are thinking about it, um, but you also can just appoint a tax representative or at least get your VAT registration. Um, the important point there is uh, what can you do uh, what or what should you do? It's linked to um, employees, um, to offices. So do you rent some um, a warehouse? Do you have some employees in France? So then you have no other option than to have a subsidiary or a branch. We could have uh, some exceptions if you just have one people to manage yourselves, huh? but otherwise you need a VAT, a VAT registration. You can manage it. The good thing is um, it can be, it's what we call f uh, VAT identification, because in France, it's not the same in all EU countries, in France, as mm. a UK company, you can manage it yourself from the UK, you don't need a fiscal representative and you don't need uh, to appoint someone. Uh, you can do it by yourself. If we can move to the next one. So, sorry, it's a little, um, a, a lot of data in it. Uh, it's there because it will be published, uh, um, sent to uh, all of you. When we speak about imports in France, uh, important point, if you sp speak about the, the top uh, lines, um, as I said, we can use French anticip anticipated customs declarations. So if you have a French VAT number, it will allow you to import in France. Huh? For sure, you need an EU ARI number, not only a French one, an EU ARI number. You also need a French customs broker uh, to do it. Huh? So as you are a foreign company, the broker will be fully responsible for you. So it means um, you may have to explain what you are doing. <laughs> uh, they are not going to say, yes, just come on. Uh, they will ask about, they will have questions about the goods, about your flows. It's normal. And once you have your VAT number in France, you can use some 
42, uh, you can uh, perform some 42 regime imports, meaning you import in France without VAT, and then it's intra-community deliveries to other EU countries. You can perform some French, uh, some uh, imports in 40 regime, mean you are importing in France and you stay in France. As uh, Jean-Michel said, you have postponed accounting in France, so it's uh, an option today. It will be mandatory 1st of uh, January uh, 2022. Um, and, uh, uh, you can also have some local sales, or uh, also you can, from uh, France, uh, if you have a VAT number, organize intra-community deliveries. Huh? It's, uh, it can be mixed. At, um, if I speak about the last line, it's, it's an exception. If you don't have a French VAT number, I know it's uh, a question some companies have today, um, you can still import in France without a French VAT number. But in this case, it means it's only the 40 regime, meaning you have to import in France, you pay uh, VAT, there is no postponed accounting option, you pay VAT, and it's mandatory to only have local sales, uh, B2, B2B sales, uh, not e-commerce, and B2B sales, and it will be that excluded because uh, of reverse charge mechanism we have in France. So you see that in all the schemes there, when you import in France, you never have VAT, except if you import without VAT number to, to sell in France. This VAT can be refunded if you um, use the last option, uh, using the 13th VAT directive. In this case, you need to appoint a fiscal representative. It is the only case. And on the other side, uh, if we move to the exports, uh, using a French VAT number, you can also export from France. Um, so you can purchase some goods from the EU, store them in France, for example, and then export from uh, France to the, to the UK, or you can organize local purchase, then you have no VIT on local purchase thanks to AE2 authorization, it's an authorization to purchase without VIT because you will export the goods. Huh? So it, again, you see that in France, it's a specific case where you can purchase and sell without VIT fully exempted, in fact. Um, of course, there's the case uh, when you are uh, exporting from other EU countries uh, to the UK, uh, you cannot export without, with a French VAT number in another country. Huh? But then if you cross France, you do your export declaration in when you cross. If you can move to the next uh, slide, please. So, um, again, it's just to, uh, to have a, a, a warehouse in the middle. Huh? You have a warehouse in the middle. Um, a few things have been uh, explained by uh, previous um, people in, in the call today. So you can avoid double taxation uh, using a bonded warehouse because, for example, uh, if you are importing uh, Chinese goods, but part of it will go to EU, a part of it will go to the UK. If you import it in France and then send them to the UK, you will pay twice your duties because it will still be uh, Chinese goods. Huh? So that's why in this case you can use a bonded warehouse. Um, but out of the bonded warehouse, you can import them, as I said, and then you go back to the fiscal rules. Um, it means you can have a bonded warehouse with an establishment or with a VAT number or, or even with nothing if it's only about storage and out, huh? um, if you don't import in France. Um, also, you can do your import declaration. You may uh, use the one of the French uh, simplification, uh, like such as a uh, pre-lodge pre uh, import declaration. You move under free circulation, you store in France, and then you deliver. Again, it's not linked to do I have an establishment or not. Um, it's more linked to VIT registration, and the establishment is more linked to your activity. If you have some people uh, to manage a warehouse, you need an establishment for sure. Uh. Thank you. If you can Thank you very much, Olivier. So now moving on to the final presentation. So on the solutions that the Eau de France region can, can provide. 
uh, as the slides are, are put up. Um, so uh, as, as you've heard, there are a number of constraints uh, that you will have to get around in order to uh, continue accessing EU clients. And some of the solutions that the Eau de France region can provide are the following. So you could obviously designate a fiscal representative, um, as has been pointed out before, that will allow uh, you to uh, basically simplify your overall process and most importantly, uh, prevent your clients from being hit with hefty uh, bills, hefty additional charges when they uh, import some of the goods that they actually sell. Uh, you, might, you might have heard some of the stories in the news recently. Someone bought a 200 pounds coat and they had to pay an 82 pounds uh, additional charge in order to account for a variety of uh, customs charges, VAT uh, and uh, courier charges. So that's really one important uh, thing you can do. Another one is uh, basically taking up space in bonded warehouses. So as has been pointed out before, uh, these are warehouses that have received customs certification. So uh, you can more easily clear customs duties uh, using uh, by using them. And uh, that's basically one way to use uh, that specific warehouse in the EU as a one-stop shop before distributing to clients across the EU. But finally, you could also set up a company in the Eau de France region. And that's really uh, a, more, a more sort of global solution to the overall problems and constraints that, uh, that arose since the 1st of January. It basically allows you to convert your B2B flows into your, sorry, your B2C flows into B2B flows. So uh, rather than having your clients uh, deal with the multiple uh, issues related to trade, you really uh, keep all these issues within the company and the, they'd be really sort of uh, intergroup uh, issues and that basically simplifies your overall process from, from the client's perspective. Um, as uh, Jean-Michel pointed out, basically, unfortunately, since the 1st of January, it's no longer possible for UK companies to simply import goods from the rest of the world, from Asia, for example, to the UK, uh, and then re-export them to the EU. Because if you do that, you'll, you'll be hit twice by customs and by uh, VAT. Um, and that's because of rules of origin. And I think really one of the most important articles in the UK-EU deal is the article ORIG 7, which basically sets out a number of operations which are deemed insufficient to allow for goods to have a UK origin and therefore to be exempted from, from tariffs. Uh, and these are operations such as uh, repackaging, uh, reconditioning, um, whether it's uh, well, freezing uh, specific products, chilling them, or even the slaughter of animals, for example. Uh, these operations uh, really will not allow you to have tariff-free access to uh, EU clients. So that's where it's more important to import these goods directly into the EU, even if there are additional transformations that need to be done uh, locally. And in addition to that, that allows you to have a sort of made in EU or made in, made in France label, which can also help from a client's access uh, perspective. Um, so why the Eau de France? Well, for uh, one uh, very strategic uh, reason in particular, which is probably the, the most important from our point of view, it's really a strategic location. As you can see on this map, the Eau de France region is basically the, the French region which runs from the outskirts of Paris all the way to Calais and Dunkirk. And if you take a 300 kilometer radius around Lille, which is the capital of the region, well, you capture major capitals such as Paris, London, Amsterdam, uh, Brussels, obviously, and uh, within this radius, you have 78 million consumers with an annual purchasing power of 1.5 trillion euros. And that's just two or three hours truck ride uh, away. So that's really a strategic location which matters in terms of accessing EU clients efficiently and in a cost efficient manner. Um, in addition to that, so we are the second French region for overall foreign uh, direct investments. And that's been so for the past uh, three years. So it shows that a number of international companies and investors do value this strategic location. And we have even been first for industrial FDIs in over the past two years. This year we went on to being second, but obviously our aim is to uh, go back on the top. And we are uh, the first French region in terms of foreign uh, direct investments into logistics. So that's really a uh, crucial sector for uh, this region overall. So we have a number of uh, important homegrown companies as uh, highlighted on, on this slide here. Uh, some big names which you may already know, such as Decathlon, Bonduel, uh, or even Roquette and Le Saf for the agri-food uh, business. We also have a number of international companies who set up uh, here. And for example, just, just uh, to, to give one, the uh, largest Amazon warehouse in Europe is in the region here, just outside Amiens. So it really speaks to the, uh, the size and importance of uh, this sector and the quality of the services that, that can be provided.
These are my contact details if you want to get in touch for any more specific uh, and personalized um, advice or a personalized discussion on uh, uh, why you may uh, set up in this region and what we can do spe specifically to, to help you. Now we can move on to questions and, and answer. So we have received uh, a number of questions uh, in advance. Uh, please feel free to can you continue putting them uh, through the chat and we'll answer them as things uh, go forward. So one first question that we received is the following. We export products from the UK to France. Our, contact, our contract with our customers is that they are responsible for import VAT. Can our customers be able to roll this payment of import VAT into their normal VAT payment cycle, uh, which would allow them to prevent payments at the point of uh, uh, goods entry. Maybe one for Jean-Michel, if you want to have a go at it. I, I think the, 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 ma the, the, the major advice I, I can give is that we need to, to know the, uh, the INCO term and, uh, and the repartition of responsibilities between the, 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 the supplier and, and the buyer. And uh, if, if in function of this, uh, of this choice, uh, it will be to the, uh, the, the buyer, the, the, the French buyer, to, to make the, the custom formalities and, uh, and to pay for, for, for VAT at, the, at, at importation. Uh, I think um, it, the, 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 main, uh, the main advice is to, to know exactly what is the, the INCO term. Okay, and, and ju just to, to continue on that, so that means that the, uh, the, the, the customer wi who is in Europe, um, do they have to pay the VAT at the point the good arrives in the EU, or can they roll that VAT payment into the normal VAT yes, payment it, cycle? Yes, uh, in France we have made a choice to, 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 to put it in the, in, the normal, in the normal way, so you have not to pay it for, uh, you, you have just to cook could calculate the, the the amount of VAT, but you pay it uh, in the normal in the in the normal way uh, by uh, the, the the French fiscal surf French or the other member states f uh, fiscal services. Okay, perfect. And that relates to another question that we received uh, on this topic as well. Um, so we export products from the UK to France. If we were to move our products in a warehouse in France, so a bonded warehouse, for example, before selling to our customers, are we liable to import VAT at the point of entry into France? Uh, in fact, I think it's, it, it was one of the cases uh, made by... Uh, by um Olivier, uh, you, you can, uh, if you don't know exactly the, desti the final destination of your, of your goods, uh, you, you can put them in, into, uh, into a warehouse, in a in custom warehouse, uh, and, uh, and we, you will have to pay the VAT only for that, uh, th that goods that uh, entering, uh, entering France, at, uh, but it, it will be at the, uh, at the exit of the warehouse, uh, not at the entry. Perfect. So that really shows, I mean, this is what we were talking about before, uh, why it's really interesting to uh, take up space in bonded warehouses in the Order France to facilitate distribution to, to clients overall. Yes, Olivier, go ahead. Uh, just to add, uh, we are paying, uh, speaking about paying the IT. Um, uh, as we said, you also have postponed accounting, meaning the importer, uh, if you, the importer has a French VAT number, it can be postponed. Huh? It's uh, just a request to, to be sent to customs authorities. Uh, and it will be mandatory uh, starting 1st of uh, January uh, next week, huh? next year. So uh, it's not really a subject about paying, but it's more, most about uh, how to declare VIT. Perfect, thank you. So another question we have is uh, the, the following. We generally use a recognized delivery company for the majority of our shipments and infrequently haulage companies. Is there still an advantage in having uh, our own customs broker and anticipated customs? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's a very clear answer. If I just have a w one word, is to anticipate. So I think it's a good solution. No, absolutely, perfect. Um, so other questions that, that we have here. Um, so one, it's rather long, um, is, uh, is there any plan of any, for any support uh, for those who want to do customs declarations in France for export to the UK and import from the UK? In particular, our customers ask us if it, may, if it would make sense for them to establish their branches or subsidiaries in Eau de France to facilitate their trade with the EU, 
we handle customs clearance for them in the UK already. Uh, they need the same in France. Uh, so maybe well, before uh, Jean-Michel or Olivier uh, uh, take that up, I think, well, obviously it's, it's really easiest and sort of yeah. global solution to set up a company uh, in Eau de France as this allows you to, do, to deal with pretty much all issues, whether it's uh, customs, VAT, access to clients and, and others. But uh, obviously there's perhaps other details that can be taken care of. Yeah, uh, as I said, in fact, it's linked to um, the activities you would like to, to have in uh, Eau de France. If it's just about trade, meaning you import, you store, and then from there you sell to all EU, for example, uh, you just need a VAT number, a French VAT number. If it's uh, uh, about, uh, um, if you want to rent a warehouse, if you want to have some people, then you need a branch. Uh, so it's more linked to what you want to do. If it's just about trade, you just need a VAT number, so it's, uh, I would say, not so expensive, in fact, huh, to start trade uh, in France. And some companies st quite often start with a French VAT number, and once it's growing, huh, <laughs> the activity is growing, then they open a branch, uh, they set up a branch. Huh? It's a classical uh, way. Okay, perfect. And to, to complement on that, I mean, one thing that we did not say at the beginning, which but which is very important, is that uh, if we look at how trade has behaved since the 1st of January, things have been pretty much okay since the beginning. I mean, obviously, that's uh, largely thanks to the great preparations that have taken place locally uh, from uh, the, the from customs services from the Eau de France region, but including through the work we have been doing with uh, with British authorities in particular. Um, so another question we have, uh, my supplier in France charges me uh, including carriage to my B2B customer. Can I use my B2B invoice for the UK import instead of the invoice from the French supplier to my company, uh, avoiding my customer seeing my cost price? Uh, I think it depends uh, of on, on, on customs, on, on British customs, uh, okay. to, to, to say uh, what is the good uh, invoice to be used uh, with the, the import declaration. I, I, I think we have a subject also behind linked to triangular sales. Uh, so, because uh, as EU con a country, uh, the UK uh, in the past, uh, British companies were able to organize triangular sales from one country in the EU uh, to the UK, with, but with some sales to other EU countries in the middle. In fact, it's not possible anymore. Uh, it's Brexit. Huh? So, uh, the triangular sales are not possible except if the British company as a, f a VAT number, not only French, but a VAT, VAT number somewhere in the EU. Um, and then after, uh, you know, it's classical to have some sales during the transportation. Uh, so if we move out of a triangular sales, um, so if you are able to change the invoice, I mean, you have an, ex an export in Germany, and uh, someone, another company uh, is selling the goods after the export, um, thinking about it, no, no, it won't work because you are on the road. It works when you are uh, on a vessel. Huh? <laughs> now on the road, it will be difficult. Now I think it's really linked to trying yourselves. Then if you have a VAT number, you can, um, you can do it. Just thinking, but yeah. Okay, perfect. So uh, another question, um, French VAT registration for UK uh, LTD company with planned warehousing in France, where to find good accountants and cost-effective ones for smaller businesses? So here, that's typically the kind of services where we can help. So maybe if you send us an email directly uh, at my contact details, which I have shown uh, before, uh, we can put you in touch with uh, a number of companies locally who can provide you with good advice and good accounting and banking services. Uh, Olivier, do you want to say a word on that as well? Uh, link to contact, uh, um, for sure, we have a lot of uh, brokers or fiscal representative in France. Um, um, link to uh, customs brokers, and sometimes uh, I know some companies are looking for specific uh, contact for SPS goods. Uh, so um, TLF uh, overseas, uh, the French Logistics Association, is also able to provide uh, a list of all the contact uh, uh, linked to different activities. So uh, I think we will also provide the, um, after the, the conference uh, the link and the email where the people can send a, requ a request to get the list. Yeah, perfect. Another question maybe for, for Jean-Michel. Um, how, ca how can we improve the UK's provision of veterin veterinary services for EHCs, so export health certificates? These are really for uh, products of animal origin or of plant origin. Um, this will become an increasingly crucial service industry. Can UK customs agents legally help EU customers with the European tracer system that pre-notifies goods coming, from, coming to the EU? 
What is important uh, with uh, SPS, uh, SPS goods is to, to anticipate uh, and that we have all the information in, in trusses in the EU syst system, which is called uh, trusses. And it's, it, it allows us, and especially not French Custom, but uh, the services of the Ministry of uh, Agriculture, uh, to, uh, to work on, uh, on the operation before the track arrives in uh, Calais or, uh, or Dunkerque. But it needs that uh, the pre-notification has been made before uh, in, in, in trusses. And it can be, it can be made by the, the, French de the French or the EU destin uh, destinataire or, the, or the, the custom brokers which, is, uh, which will uh, uh, take in charge uh, all the customs and, and sanitary uh, formats. It, is. it also can be made by, of course, the custom, the, 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 the custom broker in, uh, in uh, UK. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So another question maybe for, for Olivier. Uh, what is the best way for UK exporter who does not wish to create a tax presence in France to supply product into France with the least input from our French customer to make it as easy as possible for our customer? So it's um, what I, I said in, the, in one of the options. Uh, then it means you don't have a French uh, VAT registration, and you, you are able to, if, only if it's for B2B business, huh, you can ask a, a French broker to perform an import declaration, they will pay VAT, VAT will have to be paid, it's mandatory uh, uh, during uh, doing the import, and then you sell, if it's only to sell in France, you can sell, uh, VAT excluded thanks to reverse charge mechanism in France. So, uh, and uh, um, the important point is uh, VAT is not lost, huh? but be careful. In some in countries like Spain, if a, a British company imports in Spain, or you cannot do it without VAT registration anyway in Spain, but even with VAT registration in Spain, it's lost. You won't get refund. Huh? So, in France, you will get refund using the 13th, uh, 13th VAT directive. Uh, and then you need to appoint a fiscal representative in this specific case, so not to import, but after, if you want your refund, and I guess you want it, <laughs> you will have to uh, ask someone to manage it for you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question for Jean-Michel. How to quickly become an RDE, uh, représentant en douane enregistré in France? Uh, you have to be agreed by uh, French Customs Administration, and, uh, and then uh, the best advice I, I can give you is to, uh, to address uh, the pôle d'action économique, uh, the free uh, pôle d'action économique we, we have in, uh, in, in Eau de France. They can uh, give you all the, all the, the processes to, to, be, uh, to be agreed. Okay, perfect. And uh, the contact details are on the presentation you showed before, so that will be easily accessible as well. Uh, another que question on e-commerce. Um, are there simplified procedures for e-commerce on products considered as low value? Uh, the difficulty with this question is that um, the, the regulation, the, the EU regulation will, will change uh, during this year. and. Uh, that, that, that we now we can spoke about, about low low value. Uh, I think it will not be exactly the same case uh, in uh, in six months. So very difficult to have a precise a precise answer. Um, may, maybe uh, you you can contact uh, your uh, our pole d'action économique uh, or our direction générale uh, to to be to have a, a final a final answer. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and then we are a UK-based company supplying agri-foods and fresh produce from Africa. How can we stay active and gain market share in Europe during the post-Brexit transition and, and thereafter? So that's indeed a very important question. And uh, I guess obviously that the key message from, from that perspective is that for all uh, companies and exporters outside the EU and outside the UK uh, who used to export first to the UK and then re-export into the EU. Uh, the simplest thing really, uh, given the new uh, trading relationship, is to export directly into the EU. Uh, that will avoid uh, being hit twice by customs and, uh, and VAT. And, that, and that's especially the case if the uh, operations performed in the UK are relatively minor, uh, if they're just about repackaging, painting, simple operations. I mean, all those listed in, in this important article, uh, ORIG 7, in the UK-EU uh, free trade agreement. Uh, I think that's really the overall message, but I don't know, I don't know whether either of you wants to add anything to that. I think it's uh, important. I mean, if it's um, agri-food, uh, 
to be delivered in the EU. Uh, the best option is to import it in the EU, and it, uh, it's not linked to Brexit directly. I mean, uh, we have always been importing in the EU goods from uh, other third countries, so, so no big issue. Uh, it would be just uh, not the same ports, I would say. Huh? Yes. That, that, uh, you, you need, uh, because it's agri-food, you just need to, uh, to have the set, uh, sanitary certificate uh, uh, from the, 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 the country of origin. Okay, perfect. Um, another question. So the implications of the new EU-UK FTA for industries of developing countries, namely African ones, uh, that are not from the Commonwealth area. So I think here it's really the, uh, the, this the same topic whereby uh, all uh, companies or exporters which are outside the UK and the EU uh, would find it much easier if they export directly into the EU, or at least if their ultimate client is, uh, is in the EU uh, in, in particular. Um, another question maybe for, uh, for Aline, uh, if, uh, if Aline uh, hears me, uh, on, the, uh, on CE marking um, and basically what the uh, UK EU uh, FTA actually says about um, the marking of products and how companies should manage it. I uh, don't know whether Aline, if you can hear me. I can, I can hear you. Thank you, Atus. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that question. I mean, the bottom line is that the TCA does not provide much in terms of mutual recognition uh, of, of sort of uh, CE marking or of a type of, of labeling for, for products. So for, for countries that are placing their products on the EU market, they just need to make sure that they comply with, with the specific EU rules. So just take a look at the blue guide that is sort of the, the CE marking guide in, in Europe that, that gives you very good a definition of who is the manufacturer, the importer, the distributor, and then all the associated responsibilities that, that goes with that specific sort of um, role in, 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 in the sort of placement of the product on the, on the EU market. So CE marking is something that um, you know will will continue to apply when you want to to import and place a product on on the e, on the EU 27, and then on the GB slash UK side uh, we we now have of course that new uh, marking regulation UK CA that I'm sure you have already seen uh, if you if you managed to to come uh, to, if you are in the UK or if you've managed to, to come to the UK. Uh, since since the end of the transition period, so we we now have you know sort of additional mar marking requirements on specific products in in the UK. So now we have looking uh, basically the bottom line is it's two different markets with two different set of rules. So just make sure you you anticipate those type of additional requirements that customer authorities also check at point of of import. And, and maybe to, to add on that, uh, what about um, equivalence decisions? Uh, I mean, for for businesses who are watching us right now, um, how what should they expect basically in terms of equivalence decisions for regulations in a variety of sectors, whether it's the automotive sector, the well, for chemicals, the agri-food, and, and others? I mean, should they await any specific uh, equivalence decisions uh, or agreements between the UK and the EU, uh, which would sort of simplify things from a marking perspective for their products? Uh, not really from a product perspective. I mean, again, um, uh, there is no such thing as, as automatic mutual recognition. What we are talking about, the, the focus at this stage is really on the services side. And as I'm sure, I mean, we, we've not talked about uh, data protection, GDPR, and, and sort of movement of personal data from, from the EU to, to GB, they, they are, uh, to the UK. There are some specific discussion ongoing at this stage. So this will provide some sort of potential uh, recognition on, on that specific aspect of the law. The same thing with financial services, for instance, we all know that there are sort of specific discussion take, taking place at this stage. But from a product law perspective, we, we, we now have to consider uh, the UK, it's not, we now have legally the UK and the EU27 are two separate markets with two different set of rules that apply and there are no automatic mutual recognition that, that applies. So um, the, the standards have to be looked at um, independently. Perfect. Thank you very much, Aline. That's obviously a very important point to, to, to bear in mind. Uh, maybe a, a final couple of questions uh, before before we, we, we come to an end. Uh, one for Jean-Michel. So uh, is there a centralized uh, clearance procedure which would allow declaring a product in Eau de France, uh, which are uh, destined for France and uh, Europe as a whole? 
Uh, yes, we can. Uh, we can. O o it's it's simply uh, for for France. No no problem uh, to have your customs, uh, your single custom office in uh, in all France, and then uh, uh, have clearance in all in all France. But you we can extend it to uh, to the EU territory. Perfect, thank you. And maybe a final question. Um, my supplier in France charges me, including carriage, to my B2B customer. Can I use my B2B invoice uh, for the UK import instead of the invoice from the French supplier? Um, sorry, I, I believe I believe we already answered that, that, that question. Uh, that, that's a new one. So uh, what regime is best suited for repair flows for goods leaving the UK for repair in France and then return to the UK? Goods might, might be subject to duty or to 0%. I think you answered that question, but the other way around. So the question is, does it work from UK to EU to UK, basically? We have, this, we have the same in the two, in the two directions. Uh, you, you can have uh, your repair uh, in, in UK, but you, have, or you can have also the, the, the country, uh, the repair in, uh, in, into EU. So we have the, uh, what we call special procedure to, uh, to, have, to have this uh, without paying uh, VAT or, du or duties on the, uh, the, on the, um, on the, on the good. So it's, it's possible. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jean-Michel. Thank you very much, Olivier. And thank you very much, uh, Aline. So this webinar has now come to an end. We hope uh, you found it useful. Just to remind you the two key messages, uh, things have changed ra radically and uh, you should not expect any magical exemptions to suddenly restore frictionless trading. It's all uh, down to preparations. And the second key message, uh, uh, these obstacles are not insurmountable. Uh, it's all a matter of organization. We hope this webinar helped you uh, from that perspective. And for any additional help, please do feel free to get in touch uh, either with, m with myself, with uh, Olivier or Jean-Michel or with uh, uh, Aline. We'll be very happy to provide further answers. Thank you very much and have a nice day. <rire> oh, c'est pas grave, c'est pas grave, c'est bien. Assez, euh, avec, euh, non, c'est bien, oui, c'est ça. C'est. Euh,